All right, so we got the truth behind the Emperor's true form, Warhammer 40k Lord, shout out to Wes Hammer. Let's get into it. Fan of the grimdark universe known as Warhammer 40k, then I'm here to inform you that we have all been lied to. I'm oh. talking about all those glorious pieces of artwork depicting the Emperor of Mankind. Look at the resplendent Ooh. golden armor. Look okay. at the chiseled jaw and perfect hair. He looks hair. fly. Look at the muscularity. False. All of it is lies. As much as I want this golden pillar of radiant manliness to we be got real, tricked. sorry fellas, we've all been bamboozled. Ray Across many of the different Horus Heresy books, the Emperor is described differently by different people. Okay. Whether he be a loving, strong father figure or a logical, uncaring scientist, whether he be similar in statue to you or I, or an 18 foot tall golden god of war, none of these are actually what the Emperor looks like. In this video, we're gonna try to get to the bottom of one of 40K's greatest mysteries, what the Emperor of Mankind really looks like. And that's no easy task, as it's like the Emperor is constantly using a galaxy-spanning VPN or something. And speaking of VPNs, I want to give a shout out to oh, this snap. video sponsor, <laughs> Atlas VPN. Hey, West Hammer, bro, like get that? some money. No, listen, I'm gonna talk to this real quick. I did not transition. know that, like, Anyways, I thought that, everybody described him as, like, the same thing. Like, Stay whenever tuned. it came to, like, the, uh, the Emperor of Warhammer 40K, which makes all of your like, I, like I've seen, like, his face a thousand times, I believe, like, and maybe that's just, like, Major Kill's version of, like, the Emperor, whatever, but, like, I'm pretty sure we've all seen, like, the Emperor's, like, 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 face or whatever. And, like, that little chart where it has, like, the Emperor and it has, like, all, like, all the suns, like, surrounding them or whatever. Is that not well, how he looks. I thought that's that was like officially how he looks. I didn't know if there was like a massive like multiple Black like uh, versions of him that people Atlas described. VPN I did not know that. Just a Wowzer. So which one's actually like the Plus true six one? Months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. Hey, West Hammer, man, get some money. I ain't mad at you. Go ahead, man. But you'll have to be fast because it's a limited time offer. If you're an avid binger of streaming services like Netflix, HBO, or Hulu, Atlas VPN gives you Man, I haven't watched Netflix in like 20 in years. Country. I'm just going to be honest well, with you. Uh, I'll probably Libby get like Netflix le uh, next year. No, later, pro no probably later this year for the NFL Atlas game. VPN, but yeah, you can do see so the video. Having your activity tracked. And Go Chiefs! Are we did lose though. We did lose though. Simultaneously with a single subscription. And I think their coolest feature is what it is. can actually help you save money while shopping online. Now, many popular websites adjust their prices based on the region that you're in. And since Atlas VPN lets you change that, you can rest assured knowing that you're always getting the best Ooh, price Oh, it's a possible, finesse. Okay. No matter what it is you're trying to buy online. Okay. Click on the link Little in the finesse. description of this video to get some massive savings on Atlas VPN Premium for only $1.70 per month. Plus that six extra months with that 30-day money-back guarantee. It's the best Atlas VPN offer of the year, so be quick. Big thanks to Atlas VPN for sponsoring okay. this video. All right, here we go. Let's go. The Emperor of Mankind is one of the most interesting and complicated characters in any piece of modern fiction. He's an enigma wrapped in a mystery, bristling with inconceivable levels of psychic potential. He is one, if not the singular, most powerful living being in the entire 40K universe, one that the gods that dwell with the Immaterium rightfully fear. Despite his insistence that he has always just been a man, there is a mountain of evidence to suggest that he is in fact a god. Whether he became Duh. one after his entombment upon the Golden Throne, or he ascended to godhood after he stole power from the Chaos Gods on Molin. Bro, there is no way, bro, listen, man. There is no way, and as a Warhammer new booty, excuse my uh, language, but there is no way, man, you were able to go crazy and, and have, like, 20 kids. And, uh, and, like, I mean, obviously, like, you know, he used some of, like, the stuff from, like, the warp or whatever. But the fact that he still used some stuff uh, from the warp to like to, like, create some of his kids, bro... It's absolutely crazy, bro. The fact that you were able to create 20, like, mini, like, mini demi-like, demigod versions of yourself, bro, is absolutely crazy. I mean, let's be real, though. I mean, you kind of are, like, a bad father because, you know, some of your kids did turn out to be rotten, uh, you know, rotten apples. And I'm going to be honest with you, he does seem like the dad, you know, to just, you know, pay all the bills and not be there for his kid and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I mean... Listen, you, he still got to pay bills. He still got to protect and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, I feel like he's just like any other father. But listen, let's be real, bro. This man is not just like the ordinary father, man. This man created 20 d demigod versions of himself. I, I'm still like just confused over that. And at the same time, like I said before, I understand why some of his sons, you know, uh, like, I, I no, what was this? Uh, was it Horace? I understand. I kind of understand why he kind of like resented him a little bit. I think he got close to like the chaos or whatever, and that's what like really like you know influenced his mind and turned him into like you know this uh, circle loco cycle person. But to be honest with you, I did hear. Um, I forgot which uh, Primark it was, but I did hear that like the um, 
th that the emperor was like not cold towards him but i think he wasn't really there for him i mean let's be real bro he got 20 kids bro he ain't gonna be there for everybody i'm just gonna listen let's just keep it real it's not like they were meeting up for sunday night football and having a sunday night dinner every sunday i mean let, let, let's just keep it real bro they, like bro all the kids got blasted off into different planets and stuff like that all the kids got knocked around like like their eight ball pen uh, uh sorry eight ball balls and stuff like that so if i'm being honest with you bro i mean like there's only something bro he got 20 kids y'all like like i'm gonna be honest with you if, if i'm one of the kids that you know if i don't see like my dad or whatever and, I, and i'm one like one of the primarchs i'm gonna be real with you bro I ain't gonna really take it to heart, bro. He got like 19 other kids. I mean, bro, two of our brothers are, are just, they got they got decimated. We don't even know what happened to him. If I speak of him, I'm dead. It is what it is, man. Or that he simply was one all along, but played the role of a human being to suit his purposes and further his ultimate objectives. All of this remains intentionally unclear. But one thing that we can be absolutely certain of with the emperor is that the one that we think we know doesn't exist. And I know that may be a little bit of an obvious statement considering he's a fictional character. Duh. But the same idea holds true in the lore 40k as well. As all of the artwork we have ever seen of the Emperor is a lie. In one way or another, the images we have been shown of this person are intentionally misleading. In that they convey not the Emperor's true self, but what the individual artist who created it believed the Emperor to be. And mm. all of these depictions are based on what the Emperor wants you to think he is. It's super meta, but I find it kind of interesting that even the fan art of the Emperor is subjected to his deception. That the image we have in our mind is not actually the Emperor, but of the concept of the Emperor. Most of the, most of these pictures uh, of the Emperor got like black hair and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, bro, like th this last, I mean, I mean, let's, let, I mean, listen. Yo, Emperor, I'm, listen, I don't know if you're a female and, and you know, l l listen, I'm just going to keep it real. If you're a female in this one, man, how you doing? But listen, if this is a if this is a dude, you know, whatever, I'm good, you know, l respectfully, bro. One that he intentionally fabricated, all according to his great plan. The basic crux of this argument is that the Emperor's true form is a complete mystery. And nobody actually knows what he looks like. The figure they see is an illusion a manifestation of his psychic will that takes the form of whatever entity will further so what about agenda. the carrot that's like in the chair is that a 14 it? foot tall glowing god of war to instill fear and any that would stand in the way of his goals then that is how a warlord of a non-compliant planet is going to see him if he needs to appear humble and meek in order to blend into a crowd you most likely wouldn't even notice his presence even if he was standing right beside you over the course oh. of this video, we're going to examine the accounts of three different characters on what the Emperor actually appeared like to them, as well as diving into two real-life interviews from authors that have written about the character for the Black Library. Oh, the snap! Now, some elements remain true for each of these depictions. The long hair, ageless face, and an aura of authority. But the differences between all these accounts are much more interesting. So, uh, r quick, real quick. So, does he, like... West Hammer, he meant something about, like, how if he was, like, you know, if he came into a situation where he wanted to be, like, swift or whatever, you wouldn't even notice his presence. So, like, does he, like, adapt to, like, uh, to, like, the environment and stuff like that? Like, I imagine, like, if he came to, like, you know, um, like, if he came just, like, on some chill stuff, I, I do imagine, like, him just, like, you know, just chilling out instead of, like, coming from the sky as his fourth, as his bro, as this Kevin Durant sized dude that's just glowing. Who, bro, his armor is just just pure gold. He got the clip, bro. He got, bro, he's drinking from the fountain of youth. He looks like LeBron a little bit. Like, listen, I'm gonna be honest. With you. I, I, I could imagine him doing that, but at the same time, you know, hearing what West Hammer said, it sounds like he just adapts to like his environment, stuff like that. I mean, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, that is like a godlike thing to do, especially like if you want to. Like, you, you can legit just adapt to any other situation like that. I'm going to be honest with you, that, that, that is crazy. But to kick it off, we're going to examine a quick passage from The Master of Mankind, oh, where the okay. Emperor is speaking to one of his custodians, Ra Endymion. And he asks him, when I speak to you, to others, am I speaking aloud? Does my mouth move and form the shapes of human language? Does a human voice emerge? Or is it merely how mortal minds process my presence and my psychic will? On numerous occasions, the custodians had seen the Emperor interact with humans on different worlds, uh, people that didn't speak High Gothic, and more often than not, spoke in a language that was unknown to anyone that was part of the Imperium. Lang wow, I didn't even notice that. 
I'm sorry I'm pausing a lot, y'all, but wait, I didn't even notice that. Wow. Wow, so he's basically saying that, okay, like, since humans are, since, like, do humans think that, like, I speak English just like them? Or do they just automatically assume that because they're just going off of, like, not what they know, but just, like, it's, like, it's a natural thing. Even, bro, we as humans think that, you know? Like, I, like listen, I'm, I'm a believer. You know, I, I believe in God and stuff like that. You know, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Um... Like, but even some like, wow, that's crazy because I don't even, wow, I, that's what sometimes I like to do is I like to compare real life to like the lore for some reason. Wow. I didn't even notice that. Wait a minute. That's crazy. Okay. All right. We're going to continue, but that's, that's wow. Which is that arose in that 10,000 years or so the planet had been completely isolated. Wow. Yet without fail, the emperor was able to speak in their tongue flawlessly. There's another interesting example of this from the novel Echoes of Eternity that details the Primarch Sanguinius's first meeting with his father. Now, the Emperor's ship had touched down on his homeworld, and Sanguinius had flown out to meet him. He had never seen a spaceship before, but noted that there was something vulturous about it. It didn't fly with grace, but with power. The first thing he saw was his custodians, armored in gold just like the ship, and he found it strange that a being that would call himself his father would need such guardians. Welcome to Balfora Outlanders. Okay. He spoke Anakian, the tongue of his people, the pure. He wondered if the Outlanders would understand him or whether they would be forced to rely on hand gestures and awkward mimicry. My son, said one of the Golden Ones, as somehow speaking it silently. He felt his father's voice for the first time as one of his own thoughts, a sensation rather than speech, backed by a tremendous feeling of suppressed force. The golden man, if he was a man that sent the contact, seemed to be making significant efforts to restrain himself or to contain the power within. There was more there though. My son rhymed with my weapon and rhymed with the ninth and rhymed with other concepts that Sanguinius couldn't parse from the core of the man's meaning. A lifetime or perspective was bound up in that contact and Sanguinius sensed only the gulf between his father's silent words and the meaning behind them. He felt no threat in the touch of mind upon mind. Confidence, impatience, love, caution, approximations of those were words couldn't quite convey the actuality. It was all in there. The man, and he did seem like a man, dark of skin and hair, smelling of metal and sweat, in possession of a heartbeat, walked closer. I am the emperor, the man said, as he stepped out of the spacecraft shadow, and I am your father. Oh, yeah. Father. He's him. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be honest with you. This emperor, hey, this emperor kid. He's him. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. He's him, bro. He's him. I'm gonna, yo. I, he, hey, he might be, yo, 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 yo. I can't lie to you, yo. The way he's speaking, bro, he gotta be him. And the way they're describing him, he's him, bro. I'm gonna be honest with you. The man had said the word rhyming in silence with master, with shaper, with creator. Sanguinius met the emperor's eyes. What he saw there, glinting in the light of his father's gaze, was the answer to a question he had never even considered. This being, this emperor, was human, but he was not exactly a man. I see the light of many souls in your eyes, many men, many women. The emperor smiled. Is that what you see? He spoke flawless Anakian, but the perfection was itself a flaw. He spoke the tongue with the same dialect and inflection as Sanguinius himself. Either the emperor was pulling the meaning from the angel's mind or imprinting meaning upon it. Whichever was true, he wasn't really speaking the language at all, nor was Sanguinius entirely certain that he could see the man's mouth move. What am I? He asked. You are my son, said the emperor. And again, the meanings and concepts danced beneath those words. You are my son was overlaid by you are a primarch and you are my ninth general and you are a component of the great work and you were stolen by the enemy. And most unsettling of all, you may have been changed by them. I don't know what you mean. You will, the emperor assured him. Now compare this powerful description of Yo. a meeting with the emperor by one of his sons to that of Ark and Land, a member of the Mechanicum that is famous for having invented the Land Raider as well as the grav treads on the custodian. Hey, I'm going to just keep it real. I, I won't believe a word coming out of this dude's mouth. I mean, yeah, yeah, look at this dude, bro. He looks, bro, he looks, he looks villainous, bro. Like he just makes robots for fun, like. Oh no, I, no I'm, yo yo, bro, like no, 
He got that, bro. Oh, no. He got that bad guy eyebrows. Oh, no. Mm -mm. I can never. I'm going to be honest with you. Yo, yo, yo. We're not trusting a word he says. We. Dean's bikes and vehicles. Do not bow, the emperor had said. His voice was as machine-like and pure as Arkin had imagined, devoid of all tone and emphasis. Such monotone purity usually only came with significant augmentation. Arkin rose as instructed. He didn't see a warlord as many had claimed to see. He saw a scientist. Gone was the armor of the brazen Terran conqueror, replaced by a protective hazard suit suitable for work in sterile and hostile conditions alike. In this scene, the Emperor has called Arkan Lan to one of his laboratories to seek his advice, a unheard of honor for Land. The Emperor has Angron unconscious on a surgical table and has been operating on his brain to better understand the device known as the Butcher's Nails that have been implemented into him. At no point does he ever refer to him by his name or as his son. Angron is simply the 12th. In fact, all of the Primarchs are referred to only by their numbers. There's a cold, uncaring, logical nature about the way he speaks with Land, which is the complete opposite from all other noted was... accounts between the Emperor and members outside of the Mechanicum. Okay, so I was just about to say, so in this version, he sounds very, like, uh, not serious, but he sounds very, like, um, I don't know. Like in the last one, bro. Like the bro, the way West Hammer was describing the like the like the last like um like the last um what do you call it like imagery of like the emperor or whatever, bro. Bro, they made that man seem like he was like the god of Warhammer. Literally, they made it seem like he was like he was like you know like he the, like the god. In this one, he seems more of like he seems more of a he seems more like a father. In a way, in a way, and, and here, and before you guys say, wait, man, like, brother, brother, that's not how fathers, like, you know, talk. Let me explain. He seems very just blunt, not blunt, but like very just robotic and blunt. It's like the way West Ham is explaining, he just sounds very just like, he don't care. This is it. You're that. Da, 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 da. The last version, like the way West Ham explained the last one, he just sound very like, I don't know. It's just like, bro, like. The way West Hammer was like breaking it down and like the last like explanation of like how they how they described them in like the last one, bro, they made that man sound like he was like, bro, he was like the like the all like the all loving father, like bro, like like for real, like the, that's the way they made it. Like I got goosebumps a little bit. I was like, yo, hold up, yo, I got a little goosebumps. I'm about to say. Arkin had expected the Omnisaya's dispassionate demeanor, but to witness it in so intimate a context was inspiring in the extreme. So neutral, so inhumanly neutral. Divine one, he said, before he knew he was going to say anything at all. Land hesitated. You are more sanguine than I would have imagined in this moment, even knowing of your holy detachment from emotion. What would the alternative be? That I might mourn the twelfth as though it were my injured son and I its grieving father? Never that, divine one. Though some might expect it, it is not my son, Arkin. None of them are. They are warlords, generals, tools bred to serve a purpose, just as the legions were bred to serve a purpose. <sighs> Man, that is something. That, that's that do sound like something like the emperor would say. I can't lie to you. That that does sound. He sounds like a very tough. He sounds like a tough, like a real tough father. I mean, because at the same time, he's kind of like just blowing it off, like, oh, like why would I feel bad for him, like. Like, bro, I don't, have, I don't have no emotional connection with him. Like, that's not my son. You know, he's a warlord. He's a general. You know, he he was made to serve a purpose. Like, it's like a in-between. Like, it's it's confusing because at the same time, you're kind of, like, blowing them off as, like, you know, like, you don't really care about them. But at the same time, you're you're hyping them up. Like, you're bigging up their name as you're saying, like, oh, bro, they were they were born to do this. You know, they're generals. They're warlords, whatever. Um, and stuff like that. Let me see this. Just as the legions were bred to serve a purpose. See now, okay. See now, he mentioned the legions, which makes me think like he's basically saying that you know what, like bro, you were you were just made to serve a purpose, just like everybody else. I think that's what he's saying right now. And if that's the case, I'm gonna be honest with you. I take that back. This is not. This does not sound like the emperor. This does not because if that was the case, he would have made them just like everybody else. If, if they're if. Even though everybody, you know, has a part or whatever, 
if that was the case and like how you're blowing them off whatever and like they're warlords warlords or whatever and they're supposed to be like the leader of the legion or whatever and they're just doing their job cool i understand that but if that's the case you wouldn't really like what's the point like what's the point of even giving each legion um a primarch or a leader what, what was the, what's the point if you don't care about them if you don't because he basically he's basically saying that bro i don't care like i don't care bro he's he said bro like you think i'm about to feel bad for a guy uh because you think that i'm his son or whatever like no bro you're not my son you're a general you're a warlord that's it um th this second person uh this second like you know um explanation of the gen of, of the um emperor bro do sound very cold i will admit that i, I don't think this is i don't think this is the right description i mean West Hammer said there is no right description. So, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I would definitely rather have the first explanation of the Emperor, in my opinion. He just sounds soulless. I'm going to be honest with you. The Primarchs. It is said they have always called you father. It seems so sentimental. I've never understood why you allow it. There was once a writer, he said, a penner of children's stories, who told the tale of a wooden puppet that wished to be reborn as a human child. Nah. And this puppet this automaton of painted carved wood nah. that sought to be a thing of flesh and i'm blood not no nope. do you know what it called its maker what would such a creature call the creator that gave it shape and form and life father arkin felt his skin crawl a high understand divine one ah uh, nah okay so let's compare these two different encounters nah. with sanguinius um, nah. there is so much weight and emotion behind Facts. every syllable that the emperor speaks Facts. concepts and themes so great that they would take an eternity to fully explain yet they are there their meaning interwoven with his words there is emotion and nuance he appears as an inspiring leader and a loving father at the same time Facts. despite the enormous amount of weight and layered meaning behind each of his words their gravitas is observed without question even if even for a primarch the gulf of their meaning cannot be fully understood exactly what one would expect from the father of the primarchs but with a member of the mechanicum monotonous purity void of all emotion one who only refers to his children as numbers and sees them as little more than tools to be used and discarded exactly what a techno archaeologist such as land would expect from the avatar of the machine god two yeah. completely different I, I individuals don't. seeing a completely different emperor it's what's, what's one do you guys think man I, I don't i don't think i don't think it's the second one i don't i think it's the first one I, bro it only makes sense though right and then and then you gotta you gotta remember this way right because i never read any of the books and stuff like that but i do remember there was this, uh this one part where they were having like the uh the the civil war right and i remember like bro the emperor was helping out the other nine the other nine um the like the nine um oh my god what is it called he was helping out the other nine um factions or whatever go up against horus and and the other nine y'all remember that so like I don't think bro if the emperor was really like that bro I don't even think that I don't I feel like the second version of the emperor would just let him fight if that's the case like he sounds so just like nonchalant and he don't care and stuff like that yeah I don't I don't think it's the second one and it would bro it would make the emperor seem like it would make the emperor seem so lame I'm be like it, but that's just me I'm gonna be honest with you honestly kind of fascinating so we know that the emperor is able to imprint on the minds of anybody he comes into contact with when he speaks all those who hear him hear exactly what he needs them to hear in order to fall in line with his plans and this isn't limited to just literal words as there is so much more to speech the way one structures a sentence the inflection they use their body language all of these things are manipulated in a person's mind to present the image of perfection and absolute authority it's neither here nor there and it admittedly might not be a super relevant point, and I considered cutting it out of my script. But when I learned about this, I thought that it was very interesting that this is also exactly how demons of Slanesh operate, appearing to you as the most beautiful person you could imagine, and speaking in such an alluring way that they can manipulate you down the path of damnation. It's almost like the Emperor is doing the exact same thing, but with the ultimate goal of compliance and order, rather than unrelenting hedonism. What's really interesting about this is that even a species like the Eldar doesn't have a real concise view of who or what the Emperor actually is. As there's an Eldari in the novel Godblight 
that mentions to the Eldar the Emperor has always been chameleonic, and that when trying to view his futures, all possible paths tend to burn away, and that try as hard as they might, the Eldar can't look on him or his futures directly, that he is a completely unknowable entity. It's actually a great shame that the Necrons were still asleep in their tomb worlds at the time of the Great Crusade. Wow, so like they can't even, they can't even like look towards his future. These people right here, I think they're known for like, like looking at people's like future and stuff like that. They can't even look at the Emperor's future. Like their stuff just burns away. Yo, that's crazy, bro. I mean, but like if that's, I mean, that, it makes sense, bro. If he's like. Bro, he sounds like he is legit, like, the god of this franchise. I'm going to be honest with you. It, 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 that's what it sounds like. I'm going to be honest with you, bro. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy, bro. Turn away. And that try as hard as they might, the Eldar can't look on him or his futures directly. That he is a completely unknowable entity. It's actually a great shame that the Necrons were still asleep in their tomb worlds at the time of the Great Crusade. With the exception of Trazen, who I don't think ever interacted with him, and the Silent King that was outside of the Milky Way at the time, as it would be really interesting to hear what they experienced when talking to the Emperor, considering that they're little more than an Ingram copy of consciousness downloaded into a mechanical body. One of the most often quoted interactions with the Emperor is from the Master of Mankind, where a group of Sisters of Silence are permitted entry into the throne room. Individuals who are known as blanks that project a negative psychic aura, the Emperor's ability shouldn't be able to affect them. If anybody could see through his illusions to see his true form, it would be them. Past experience told her that the blinding majesty and stupefaction others felt in the presence of the Golden Throne were wholly absent for Kyria and her sisters. She saw a man on a throne, no more, no less. No radiant halo, no psychic corona. She would have preferred the majestic ignorance. Better to feel everything and see almost nothing rather than stare upon the naked truth. I mean, but like, what if she, okay, so this is their version of it. She basically, she basically saying that, okay, like, he's not nothing. There's this, he's just a guy on the throne. That's just it. I mean, but if that's the case, right, can't he like, can't he like make it seem like that way? Like, isn't he like powerful enough to the point to where like he can just make himself into like this normal guy towards certain people? Can, can he do that? I'm pretty sure he can do that, right? If he can, like, suppress his power to the point to where, like, nobody else can, like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, like, get, get blown away from, like, all of his power or whatever. I'm pretty sure, like, and also, bro, th listen, I'm going to be honest with you. This emperor dude sounds like he's, like, all-knowing. So, like, what if he knew that, like, she was there or whatever, and he basically just, like, made himself look, not worthless, but, like, made himself look regular, like, normal, whatever, like, in, like, her eyes, whatever. I, I think he can do that. I'm going to be honest with you. Man, bro, this emperor dude, bro, bro, we got to, like, check more up on him, bro. The enthroned emperor was just a man in pain. His suffering etched plain. His mouth open in a silent scream. The agonies he endured for the sake of the oh, species wait. had wrought lines upon his face. Oh, she's talking about whenever, uh, he, she's talking about, um, whenever the emperor, because he's, like, a carrot right now. He got, like, a thousand ascension cords connected to his brain. And they're sacrificing like a thousand people a day for him. She's talking about that version of the emperor, right? Teachers, somehow bringing the passage of time to an ageless face. We've established that everybody sees the emperor. Or no, she's talking about the, some more dramatic than others. What the sister sees is just a regular guy, one who has had the entire weight of the galaxy, as well as all the hopes and dreams of the species resting on his shoulders for a very long time. Now, this is me just thinking out loud and doing a bit of speculation, so take it with a grain of salt. But I'm not even convinced that the Sisters of Silence saw the real Emperor. That's what Much I like how psychers have a scale based on their abilities, the same is true for blanks. When a blank encounters a particularly powerful psyker, the psyker is often able to overcome the blank's negative aura and still channel their abilities, even if those abilities are admittedly diminished. You can think of it in simple terms of negative and positive numbers canceling each other out. Okay. If the scale goes from negative 100 to positive 100, Zero. then a blank at negative 50 power encountering a level 100 Psyker, the Psyker is still going to be operating at around 50% of their abilities. Oh, my, my bad. Bath math. I thought it was zero. <laughs> bad math. Hey, 
Hey, listen, I promise you, I ain't get an AMF. The Emperor is known to be the most powerful <laughs> psychic entity in the universe. I don't believe there is a blank alive that could overcome the sheer magnitude facts. of his abilities. That's what I, that's, facts. However, when that particular passage was written, he was already on the Golden Throne, holding back the warp. So it's very possible that she did, for just a moment, get a glimpse at the real man. As to say he was distracted would be a massive understatement. The reality is we just can't be sure, which is okay. That mystery is what makes- Bro, that man, bro, he's not a re bro, he's holding back the warp. I don't think he's a regular man. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't think that, bro, listen, that man is holding back the warp. Bro, he is legit putting this whole franchise on his head. Literally, you see how many extension cords he got connected to his head, bro? You see how many shower tubes he got connected to his head? Bro, he's legit putting this thing on his head, literally, bro. He's wearing this thing like a baseball cap right now. I'm pretty sure he's not a regular man. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It's the Emperor so interesting. And outside of the novels, a few of the authors who have written his character in the past have had some pretty interesting things to say about him in interviews. The first I wanna talk about is an interview that Dan Abnett gave, where he sought to answer some questions about 40K's biggest mysteries. One question in particular was about what the Emperor actually looked like, and he had this to say. The Emperor presents himself, like any good god should, in the form that is most useful to him to get across. You think about the Greek gods appearing as rams and snakes and all that kind of stuff because they, you know, they want to pull a fast one or they want to trick somebody or whatever like that. The Emperor is the same. He is, what he looks like is unknown to everybody. What he appears as and manifests as is as appropriate to the circumstance. That makes sense. That makes sense. Wow, that makes sense. I told, okay, so what I said earlier was right. What I said earlier was right. He basically, in whatever situation, so he could basically adapt to anything. Like I said before, wherever he goes, he, he turns into like, he, he turns into like what he's supposed to turn into. But then when nobody's around, whatever, he's just, he's just like the, he's just like, like the God. He's legit like the God in Warhammer 40K. It's just like whenever he needs to like, uh, go talk to somebody, whenever he needs to, you know, going to war, going into war, or whatever. He appears in like this human form or whatever. Um, wow. Okay. So that, 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 I'm gonna be honest with you. That makes a lot of sense. I'm gonna be honest with you. That manifestation, particularly post unification war, that manifestation has had to be godlike. It has to be as the emperor. He has had to command respect. I find it really interesting that makes how sense. he compares them to Greek gods and the way they would take different forms to suit their purpose. This is definitely something that the Emperor is capable of, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's one of the fundamental abilities he used to unite mankind. And speaking of the out-of-universe depictions of the Emperor, when we refer to the books themselves, I think this is actually kind of a brilliant strategy for a character that is written by many different authors, each one of them imparting a little bit of themselves onto the character, and that you have an in-lore reason why he would act or speak differently from author to author. Whether this is a brilliant writing strategy or a hand-waving of inconsistencies is something that you'll have to come to your own conclusions on. In fact, leave your thoughts down in the comment section about this because I read all of them and I love hearing what you guys think. And to kind of wrap this video up, I wanted to examine one more interview, this time from a different Black Library author known as Aaron Dembski Bowden, the author of The Master of Mankind. He talks about how different people view the Emperor, what the point of his novel was, and his thoughts on how people view 40K as a whole. I'll just say this, The Master of Mankind is entirely from the perspectives of people that meet the Emperor in pretty specific circumstances. There are obviously other circumstances to come. Nothing in it is definitive, even less so than my usual work. Any definitive statement you can make about how the Emperor sees something or does something is almost always contradicted in the book itself. That's not an escape clause or an excuse, it's the point. Writing him definitively would have been the easiest and most disappointing thing in the world. And on that note, remember, everyone sees 40K differently. What Person X is absolutely certain is the truth of the Emperor, and the best way to present him would be laughed off by Persons A, B, and C. With the Emperor, a lot of interaction is about getting out what you put in. You get what you give. Your perceptions and expectations are reflected back on you, because that's how the human brain perceives everything. So, so, so basically, he's saying that the Emperor's image to everybody is very lucrative uh, lucrative so the way i see the emperor is probably a different way of how you see the emperor 
um, and, and, and you know, from this person, this person, this person, it, that makes sense. I'm gonna be honest with you. It's kind of like it's kind of like the same thing to like answer one thing. A fact that cannot be overstated. The science behind it is fascinating and all important, especially when you're talking about someone who exists on that plane of power. At one point, the emperor makes mention of the notion that he's not even speaking that being near him allows the conveyance of meaning through psychic osmosis and communication telepathically. He's not even talking. It's raw understanding filtering through a mind or just the way the mortal mind comprehends the aura of what the emperor intends. Does he only refer to the Primarchs by numbers instead of name? Some characters will swear that he does and doesn't that just perfectly match their perspectives of the Primarchs as either emotionally compromised two human things that think they're sons or genetic masterworks that have become galaxy damning screw ups. So he's lucrative. So wow. So he's not. So the emperor is not just lucrative to us as like the viewers. He's also he's also different for the actual Primarchs as well. So like I said before, how some Primarchs that might look at him as this loving father, whatever. And some other Primarchs might look at him as this, you know, guy that just call, uh, calls us numbers or whatever. So it's like different views. Oh, wow. That makes sense. Wait, is my mic on? Hold up. Hello? Wait, oh, wait. I'm going to see if my mic is on real quick. Give me one second. All right, it's on. It's on. My bad, y'all. It's on. Leading people to be exiled from their home worlds. My bad, y'all. Do you think Sanguinius will agree or care that that's what mortals think? The Emperor's portrayal on that isn't even consistent between Ra and Diocletian, two of his custodians. And on page one, the only time he interacts with the Primarch himself, and the one and only thing he says to Magnus the Red is Magnus. Like, that's a pretty strong indication that the interactions which follow are playing by different rules. Ra sees the warlord of humanity, just a man, but a great one. Weary and defiant, burdened by responsibility, demons see their annihilation and go insane in his presence. One of the knights, as they're marching through the throne room, is caught in a religious rapture, unable to do anything but stare at the glorious halo of the emperor of mankind on the golden throne. One of the sisters of silence in the same room literally just sees a man in a chair. I understand it now. It, it's different for everybody. It's, it's Wow, okay. It's like literally different experiences for everybody, just like how us, like the, like the, the, the viewers are. That's crazy. So like, there is no official way of seeing this. Wow. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Wow. Okay. Another character, not Imperial. I understand. I understand it now. The Emperor even breathes. <laughs> she believes he's a weapon left out of its box from the dark age of technology. I understand now. Only time will tell if we'll ever actually know the full truth yep. about the Emperor. I understand. But what do you guys think of all this? Is the Emperor of Mankind one of the greatest fictional characters ever created, or oh. is he a victim of lazy writing? I think, I mean, you know what? I don't know, bro. I mean, bro, I do like his character, bro. As a Warhammer new booty, I do like his character. Um, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be a little biased. I'm going to go with Explanation 1, uh, where he, where he's just this aura, 14-foot dude walking through with this gold, uh, you know, armor and stuff like that. I'm going to go with that one, but that, that's my way of seeing it. Wow. So I actually do understand it now. I do understand that everybody has like different views on him and stuff like that. I thought I, I thought this was like the I thought this was like his official look to it. So, wow, that's I, I, wow. That's crazy, man. Bro, shout out to West Hammer, man, for always breaking it down so smoothly and stuff like that, man. Uh, big shout out to him. Uh, if you guys haven't already, make sure you guys go check him out in the description down below. And uh, other than that, man. Wow, man. That's crazy. I didn't know that people, I thought everybody looked at them like the same way. That's crazy, man. Make sure you guys like the video, subscribe to the channel if you guys are new, and I will see you guys at Vix Mount, and peace out.